Good afternoon. Today is the third leader in a global, a global energy lecture. Uh, for those who think that there is no solution for creating a sustainable energy future, just think about this. Today it's Halloween. And nevertheless, we have plenty of people here in the room. So we can also do something more complicated that is creating a, a sustainable energy future. Europe is ahead of uh, the US as regarding energy sustainability. And in Europe, three countries stand out. Germany, Denmark, and Portugal. Dr. Jensen, Dr. Obendoffer, and Dr. Perdigoto, thank you very much for accepting to be here with us and to travel from Europe directly to speak with uh, the Columbia University faculty and um, students. Uh, I'm sure that uh, after the, the presentations, everybody will have uh, opportunity to raise questions about Germany and nuclear, but please think that there are other interesting <laughs> issues like renewable energy, like electricity grids, like electric vehicles. So the only issue here at stake will not be Germany and nuclear, although I think that at least half of the questions will be on that. Okay? So thank you very much. So, good afternoon. Um, every one of you know that it's very difficult to get into the United States um, nowadays. And last night I experienced that it's also not only difficult to get into the country, it can also be difficult to get into a bar. Because I was down in Greenwich Village and uh, I was entering a bar and uh, there was a doorman, and uh, he wouldn't allow me in until he saw my ID. And I was just completely puzzled because the same thing happened to me 25 years ago. Uh, and, and 25 years ago, I was much younger, and that was the explanation then. Um, so I asked him why. Well, just because. And, um, and I had this argument with him. And finally, he said the reason was that uh, they couldn't have me in if, if I had a beer and then like were dead on the floor the minute after and they wouldn't know what to do with me if they, did, if they didn't have an ID. And I told him that uh, if I had a beer and I would be dead on the floor after one beer, uh, then that would be a shame. Uh, and and, 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 and um, that since I was uh, from Denmark, um, if, if all the people in Denmark reacted like that to one beer, we would have become extinct a long time ago. <laughs> so. I'm, and I was thinking about that when going here because, frankly, I, I, I have no idea whether you know anything about Denmark and the location of Denmark. So in addition to, to my, my speech, I just wanted to start by showing you where the country is. And it actually makes a lot of sense in, in, in terms of energy to also show you that. Because the point I wanted to make about that is that no country is an island, particularly not on energy issues. And now you can see on this map where Denmark is, it's right under Norway, and the country uh, right next to it is Sweden, and um, uh, fortunately uh, Swedes are not here, because they, there's, it doesn't say Sweden there, that's a, that's a pity. We're actually smaller, Denmark, right south of Norway, just five million people. Um, and Germany is south of us with about 16 times as many people. Now, I'm going to move to the next map I want to show you because that's a lot more interesting, if I can find it. This is a map of the electricity system in this very moment. The reason why I wanted to show you that is that we are, I wanted to show you how connected we are to Norway uh, uh, in the north, to Sweden in the uh, east and, and, and northeast and to Germany uh, south. You can also see on this map that today is not a windy day. And I have checked, it is not a windy day. You can see that where it says power right now and that the wind turbines only produce 510, which is about little more than 10% of electricity in this very moment. On a good windy day, which is a good windy day for wind, uh, for wind production, but a horrible day if you're on bicycle, uh, and I do 
ride my bicycle every day. Uh, then we can go up to 50 or even 100% uh, electricity production from wind. You can see the big windmills. Uh, those, each of those windmills, the green ones, is actually not a windmill. That's a wind farm. And I, I will show you later what a wind farm is. That's a real power plant. Uh, it's not, we're, not, we're no longer talking about windmills. We're talking about power plants. Right. And you can see in this very moment, there is, there's, there's imports from Sweden. There's imports from Norway, which goes straight down to Germany and being exported. You can see there's an export in this part of the country. And there's some imports from Sweden up here. Sweden has nuclear. Sweden has hydropower. Norway up here has a lot of hydropower. We have a lot of wind power. Germany has just about everything. But it's a very, very good system of exchange of electricity. And, and uh, it's, very, it's a very important point that, that when we move towards independence of fossil fuels, well, which I will tell you about, we're also doing this while at the same time remaining to be very much in cooperation with our neighboring countries. Now, moving to my presentation, because I already probably spent the last first five minutes of it. Right. I will change technology to something which... Here we are. My presentation will be in three parts. First, I will tell something about what drives global uh, energy policy. Secondly, I will tell you something about the history of Denmark's energy policy. And thirdly, I will talk about the future of it. And don't worry, I will do it as fast as I can. And don't worry if you cannot read everything which is on the screen. You can get a copy of the presentation afterwards. If you cannot get it from here, you can get it from me. It's very essential to understand that there are four key drivers of international energy policy, and this is for national energy policy as well. One is energy security, which is often defined as, on a very technical level, but I, I usually define it as people and, and businesses getting the, the amount of energy they, they want when they want it. Uh, it's not enough to get the amount of energy if you don't get it at the point of time where you need it. There's an economic aspect of it, that it has to be affordable. And there's an environmental aspect of it. And a safety aspect. It's very much about nuclear. And if you're in doubt about that, you can ask my German colleague about the safety aspect. I don't, I, I, I'm not going to talk more about that, or just a little bit. Um, but we don't have any nuclear power, apart from the nuclear power we import from Sweden. Now, the global situation in energy policy and at the moment, if you look at energy trends, and I could speak about that for 45 minutes in itself, so, because that's my main area at the moment, there are so many uncertainties. But, but I'll have a few statements for you. First of all, the era of cheap oil is over. And there are, there are lots of reasons why. The, if there's every reason to believe that, that what we see now with the plus $100 uh, per barrel is something which will be in the future as well, probably even more. So, and th there are many reasons for it. I will not go over that right now. You can also ask whether we are facing a golden age of gas instead. Unconventional gas has become fashionable, particularly in the US. Um, LNG, liquefied natural gas, means that it's easier to transport gas. So some of the uncertainties regarding that you need pipelines to transport gas may be overcome if, if liquefied natural gas becomes cheaper. And it's certainly revolutionizing that market at the moment. But there are also lots of problems. Most of all, the environmental impacts of unconventional gas uh, that has to be overcome. So but there are some uncertainties to that. Also, the price is an uncertainty. Coal, there's always a lot of coal, they say. But that's true, and that's true, there's a lot of coal. But who says it's cheap, and who says it's without problems? Now, China's incremental demand of coal in two years equals the total size of EU's coal use. China has become a, a net importer of coal. Coal prices have gone up, 
If China continues to develop on this issue, coal will no longer, number one, be abundant, two, cheap. There's a lot of uncertainty about nuclear power due to the Fukushima accident, goes without saying. And nobody talks about the price of nuclear power. I mean, I'm talking about the economic price. There's a, there are good reasons why nobody builds new nuclear power without having the state to guarantee the costs, because it's expensive. In any case, demand for energy is rising in the world, particularly in emerging economies, particularly in China. And demand of energy is not going down in the OECD countries. Now, some countries are taking steps to move beyond this kind of picture, and there are good reasons for that, because it's good for the economy, it's creating predictable prices for businesses and consumers, and consumers, and it's good for the political independence. Who has most of the oil? The Middle East. The quote I put in, uh, which is the more than $100, is the largest transfer of wealth in human history, is, who could it be from? Anyone know? Henry Kissinger. So there's a wealth issue, a transfer of wealth issue. It's also good for the environment to move to renewable energy or move beyond the fossil fuels. I've taken this one from the World Energy Outlook 2010, which is about oil, global uh, oil production. What you can see from that one is that we have, in reality, already reached peak oil. And all the, the light blue color is what we need over the next 25 years to either find or develop. And that means that we have to find something in the range of the, the production of, of Saudi Arabia four or five times over the next 25 years because the current oil fields are drying out. We will most probably find a lot more oil. Nobody questions that. It's just becoming more difficult, becoming more expensive. Now, moving to the Danish situation from the past to the present, the situation was that before the first oil crisis, Denmark was 99% dependent on imported energy. There were only two or three countries in the world, which was Japan, Denmark, and Switzerland, I think. I'm not sure about Switzerland, but at least Japan and Denmark was totally dependent on imported energy. We went through a, a very severe economic crisis because of that. The situation today is that we have, along with Japan, by the way, and Switzerland, the lowest energy consumption per GDP unit. Uh, we have the highest contribution of electricity from new renewables, wind, biomass, these kind of things. We have a very efficient coal technology where we produce heat and electricity at the same time, thereby increasing the efficiency enormously. And we have a very high export rate of energy technology, in particular wind mills. If you look at this picture, you can see the difference from 1972, and the blue color is oil, and the green being coal. When we, after the oil crisis, we started phasing in coal, and about 1990, we started phasing out coal and replaced it with natural gas. And you can see there's a fight now where coal and oil continues to go down. You can see natural gas is sort of holding its share at the moment. Uh, and renewable energy gains weight. We have managed to deal in growth and energy consumption. We have a stable energy consumption. At the same time as we've had a 38% increase in GDP, we've had the same energy consumption which means we've become a lot more efficient. And we've reduced our CO2 emissions by 23%. We will continue to do so. Our economic forecast tells us that we will increase our GDP in the future as well, while our energy consumption will remain more or less the same, and our CO2 emissions will go down, continue to go down. It is possible to de-link economic growth and energy growth. It is possible. The key policy strategy we have is, is, first of all, a long-term strategy with broad agreement in the parliament. We have some effective subsidy schemes that we 
where we adjust. When things become cheaper, you have to adjust the subsidies. Pretty simple, but it doesn't happen everywhere. Because we have had some failure, made some failures as well. At some point where our subsidies for windmills were too high, and at some point there was a joke about uh, that windmills were no longer called windmills, windmills but gold mills, because the farmers, having put up the windmills in their backyard, uh, were receiving so many subsidies that it was just a gold mill instead of a windmill. It was fantastic for them, but it was not very good for the country. We have energy taxes. I know in this country it's a, it's a four-letter word, but it works. It, 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 it actually business com becomes a lot more competitive because they learn to be efficient. And when the economic crisis hits, they are more competitive because they, have, they are efficient. We have a suitable planning framework. Everybody talks about that. And we have a strong combination of the state and the market. This is how a windmill looks like today. This is an offshore wind park. It has 80 wind mills. This is a power plant. And this is how it looks like today. So forget about the image of one windmill. Today, when we talk about wind farming, this is how it looks like. We have four of these. Uh, and we have a fifth under construction with three or four hundred megawatts. I think it's four hundred megawatts. Huge. This is the kind of, of wind farming we do nowadays. This is a bit technical. I will run very quickly through the tender part. Because you may say, how do we finance that? What we do nowadays is we make a tender and then we guarantee for, on average, 12 years a price, a certain price, then after that, they, have, they only get the market price. The future, very briefly. The future, the government has, and, and actually the, the opposition parties as well, have a target about being completely independent of fossil fuels. And what can you do about that? And you can actually see here, this is a bit complicated, but you can see on the left-hand side you have energy consumption, and, and the way to become, and the, the, the right hand side being in a renewable energy, the way obviously is to make these two columns on equal, an equal size. And you can either do that by making the left one smaller or making the right one bigger. Or you can do both. We're going to do both. We're going to cut some of our room heating, particularly because that's, that's a, there's a big potential for cutting some of the energy consumption in room heating. Conversion loss, there's also big potential. Transport, big potential, particularly if we move to electrical cars. And renewable energy, we will be doing windmills or wind farms, and we will be doing biomass. Not as much sun. It's Denmark, you know, up north. There's not a lot of sun. Now, over the next 10 years, we have a couple of milestones I want to show you. We want 50% of our electricity to be based on wind power by 2020. Right now, it's been 20 and 25% on an average on, in a year. We want to phase out coal completely by 2030. We want all electricity, this is probably the most ambitious one, all electricity and heat to be based on renewable energy by 2035. Transport, we don't know, because we're very much dependent on the technical development here. And we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. Now, this is the final slide. Our key message in terms of moving towards independency, uh, independent of fossil fuels, is that it's challenging, it's affordable, it's technically feasible, but it also presents a lot of new business opportunities. Our wind business is big business. Renewable energy is big business. We export, for more money, wind technology than we do export bacon. As most people think that we are a major bacon exporter, we are a pork exporter. But actually, this, this biggest success in, in Danish industrial uh, history has now been taken over by, by renewable energy. Uh, that's not as bad as, as, as one could think, is it? So, thank you very much. This was my presentation. Of course, I will take questions when we get to that.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ulrich Oberndorfer. I'm from Germany, from the uh, German Federal Ministry of Economics and Technology. And I'm very proud and very happy to, to be able to come here. Thank you very much, Professor Pinyu, for the kind invitation. And um, well, this afternoon's session is about benchmarks in energy sustainability. And what I'll be doing is presenting you the um, policy approaches we have in Germany with regard to that. So, okay. I also have three parts of my presentation. I'll first of all give you a short background on, on, uh, on the situation in Germany, German energy policy. Then I will try to really briefly introduce you to the German energy concept the German government um, uh, has adopted in the last year. Actually, it, it's even two concepts. And uh, finally, um, I'll give you a short outlook and, and conclude. Okay. Let's start with a picture that perhaps most of you already know. It's taken from an IPCC assessment report, and I don't want to get into details here. Uh, I think it just shows um, temperature increases um, if climate change is, is, is happening in, in, in some years. I don't want to get into details here, but um, I think um, some things uh, or some aspects are really important. First one is that um, climate scientists really agree that climate change is a real problem. And uh, this means climate change entails phenomena like temperature increases, sea level rises, desertification, etc. And the second thing is, it's not just an environmental problem. It's really an economic problem. You can read reports like the Stern report or any other report, and what you will, uh, will, um, will learn if you read it is that it's really a big economic problem as well, climate change not only, but also um, if climate change is happening in a, in a way that we're going on with emitting in a business as usual way, then this will in entail enormous costs for all of our economies. And this is one reason why the German government has decided to act against that. Um, within the Kyoto Protocol, the German government has agreed to fulfill a minus 21% target on GHG emission reductions until the commitment period 2008 to 2012, and actually we made it. We, uh, we're even above the minus 21% as far as I knew. And uh, we want to go further down this road, and uh, our government has adopted a 40% target until 2020, and a target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 80% until 2050, all against the, um, the base year of 1990. This is all about climate change, climate policy. So you might ask, well, we're here for, for energy policy. So I'm, um, I'll start to get into that. But I'm telling you this because this is really important to understand what Germany is doing with regard to energy policy. You have to know that in Germany, 78% of all GHG emissions are energy relate related. So this means if we really want to reach those targets, if we were really want to cut our GHG emissions significantly, this requires a whole transformation of the energy sector because it's all, it's all about energy. And the second thing, and I think it's a bit, um, it's an argument from a, uh, perhaps a different perspective, climate policy should have always been a part of energy policy. It is really a, um, it is really a part of it. I think my colleague from Denmark has already pointed out that in Denmark there are three central energy policy aims and we have the same aims actually in Germany. Economic efficiency, security of supply, and environmental compatibility. Those have been the three central energy policy aims for, for decades. And of course, climate protection, that is, that is a, a Cornerstone, a cornerstone in reaching environmental comp compatibility of energy policy. But then the question is, is it sufficient to do climate policy in order to have 
a sustainable energy policy, and that's what we're talking about today. And I would say no, because sustainability has three pillars. It has a social pillar, it has an economic pillar, and it has an environmental pillar. And in order to have a really sustainable energy policy, we have to fulfill our climate goals. But we have to reconcile this goal with the other, other goals. We can't do just climate policy because we want to combat climate change, but we have to embed it in a strategy where we, we do climate policy, but we do it economically efficiently, and uh, we don't risk our security of supply. And this is really, um, it's a challenging task, actually. <clears throat> well, and as this is very challenging, the German government in 2009 decided that um, it should give itself um, a big energy strategy, and that's why we have been working on the German energy concept. This should be a, uh, well, the idea behind it was uh, that Germany should have a long-term, consistent energy strategy until the year 2050. I will, I think I will go through the three main pillars of this energy strategy. The first one is ambitious goals. Well, I already told you about the GHG emission goals we have in Germany, minus 80% until 2050. You see it in the first row, actually. Um, and then what we did for our energy concept was we developed um, we developed energy scenarios, scientific scenarios, and the idea behind it was um, what do we have to do in different energy areas in order to reach the big, the big GHG emission goal? And uh, based on this um, scientific analysis, we could identify um, some kind of a roadmap, uh, pathways in, the different, in different technologies and um, in order to reach our climate target. And um, we took those values and they are for us something like technology targets in order to reach our big goals. And I just, um, I just picked out the three most important, important ones and put it here. Um, we want to increase, first of all, the, the renewable share on final energy consumption up to 60% in 2050. We want to be even more ambitious in the electricity sector and reach 80% until 2050. And um, we have to do a, a huge progress in energy efficiency. And uh, therefore, we want to, want to cut um, energy demand by half, reduce um, primary energy supply by 50% until 2050. And of course, there are steps, 10-year uh, steps for those goals. That was the first, first pillar, ambitious goals. Then, of course, the question is always, how can you reach those goals? And therefore, we also have concrete measures in our energy concept. That's the second pillar. Well, this concept, I have it here with me. There's also an English translation. If you're interested in, you can, you can read it. Um, actually, it has 120 measures. And uh, in very different fields, renewables, energy efficiency, and so on, energy research. And um, what is important is that we're not starting from, from scratch here. But um, we have already very powerful ex existing measures in Germany. Perhaps I cite a few one. We have an emissions trading scheme in Europe. Um, you may know that where we cap um, emissions um, in the most energy intensive sectors of the whole uh, European economy. And of course, the German energy sector is one sector that is part of it. We have also eco taxes in Germany, for example. And we have a very, very strong, very successful, I'd say, a renewable scheme, a feed in tariff scheme, in order to, um, to increase the, renew uh, the use of renewables. And that was already the starting point. And now we have this concept with. 120, perhaps, new additional me measures in order to reach our goals. And um, the, final, the final pillar, I'd say, it's financing. You may imagine that many of those measures that are in there in order to achieve our, our targets, uh, they don't come for free, to be honest. And this is particularly true if you, if you look at the field of energy efficiency. There it's so difficult to, to reach 
progress. There are so many players and it's very complicated. And um, I think that the evidence has shown that providing providing financial incentives is a very useful tool in order to, to improve energy efficiency, but that is costly. And you might know that um, we, have a difficult, um, we have a difficult economic environment at the moment in Europe in general, and therefore it's not so easy to get financing for those measures. And um, against that background, I just want to share with you one detail and it's an important detail of this financing uh, concept that is in our energy concept. It's um, to use auctioning revenues from the emission trading scheme in order to finance efficiency measures. And I think it's a, a really good example um, to show how you can set up a really consistent strategy because um, emission trading is such a powerful tool. It's, you m might have learned in economic lessons that it's cost effective and it's, um, it really leads you to the environmental goal you're aiming at. But there's also another interesting feature, uh, a helpful fe feature, and this is it can uh, provide the government with uh, funds by auctioning off revenues, and we will use those revenues um, to, um, to set up an efficiency fund. Okay, so that's the three pillars of our energy concept. So um, let's have an outlook. As a first slide, I, I want to look back in this outlook and see what, we, what Germany has already done in terms of sustainable energy policy. And I think this, this slide or this graph shows that um, we have had some, problem, uh, some, some progress in the last 20 years. Um, it compares some indicators from the 1990 levels to the 2010 levels. You will see that in 1990 we basically did use only very few renewables, but today it's uh, 1,300 uh, petajoules, which is about 10% of German energy demand as a whole. And in electricity, we have even more. We have about 17%. So we did some progress there. We also had some progress in energy efficiency, but it's moving on more slowly, or it has been moving on more slowly in the past. And um, as I told you, we were relatively successful also in cutting CO2 emissions, there were side effects like the German unification, but actually with regard to energy-related emissions, we're down by, by um, I think, 23 or 24 percent since 1990. So I think this is basically one of the reasons why many call Germany as one of the frontrunners uh, for sustainable energy policy. We did have some environmental success, some emission reduction in the past. But um, remember, I showed you the, the central energy policy aims in the beginning of my presentation. It's not all about that. The policies we had in place, they also contributed, for example, to, uh, to energy security. We are really dependent on, on energy imports in Germany and uh, with the help of our renewable policies and efficiency policies, we could reduce this dependence. That was really important. And well, I think um, if you look at economic efficiency, this is more difficult to interpret and it's more difficult. But what you can definitely see is that the German economy really has made it to, to adapt itself to new markets. We have, um, we have really old um, enterprises like Siemens or BASF, uh, chemical enterprises, that are now really leaders in, in environmental services and goods like renewables or efficiency technologies. And we have also new companies, particularly in the renewables um, uh, sector, that are really good. And um, now with our energy concept, we put in more ambition into this whole process and uh, we think we will be better off afterwards. But of course there are challenges, challenges like carbon leakage, you will have heard about it. We're trying to reduce that, of course. Of course also Germany or the, the European Union, we can't save the climate if just we are acting. It's a global, global externality um, and therefore we need global, uh, global action against climate change. And well, one, one point, Professor Pugno had, has already pointed about that, but I have just one slide on it. Um, it's, um, it's the accident, the terrible accident in Fukushima in, in, on March 11. Actually, um, in our first 
draft of our energy concept, we considered nuclear energy as one, as one important low carbon uh, energy source for our energy transformation. So uh, we plan to use nuclear until the 2030s of this, uh, yeah, until the 2030s as a bridge technology. But um, yeah, after this terrible events in Fukushima, um, we had to have a, a further look at that. And actually, um, the German government has decided to phase out in a v relatively short scale out of nuclear energy until 202020. And you have to know, last year we still had about 22% of our electricity generated just from nuclear. So that's, that's a tough plan. But, um, but it's like that. And um, the main reason, of course, behind it is, uh, is um, security reasonings. And um, the German society was really interested in a, in a, um, in a quick phase out. And we, we uh, understood that. We have already closed down, already in the first year, eight of our 17 nuclear power plants. And uh, yeah, the rest will be closed down in the next 10 years. So of course you will imagine nuclear energy as a um, as a low carbon energy source. Um, this is our our goals will be even more challenging now without nuclear, and also this is challenging for energy security of course because our electricity grid was adapted to the nuclear power plants, and also our industry of course is asking us what will happen to the to the uh, to the electricity prices so um we have to deal with it from from very different perspectives and it's really a challenge and therefore basically every time i'm presenting on the german energy concept there's one person or different persons that ask me okay you have all the concept that's fine uh, it, it seems interesting but can you really make it? I mean, will it really work out? And um, so I want to be prepared for that question. And um, that's why I read The Economist, which is a, a good paper, because The Economist also asked that question to uh, one London-based energy analyst. And I really liked his answer. So um, he said, yeah, it's, it's really challenging what the Germans do. But you have to know the society is really behind this strategy first. Second, they have really they have the technologies and third they have a strong industry that can make use of these technologies so he said yeah well if there's one country that can make that this will be germany and well i have nothing to add on that thank you very much <laughs> for your kind attention Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> I want to start by thanking Mr. Pino to invite me to, to be here. Uh, for, for you is, my, uh, is Professor Pino, but for me is my ex-Minister of Economy and Innovation, Minister Pino. Uh, and uh, I have to tell you that he was an inspiration to me and he was also responsible for many achievements of those that I will present you after. Uh, I have to say that uh, today I feel like a, a colleague of you because uh, in, as in 2005 I was also a Columbia a student. Uh, because I assisted to uh, business uh, in, a, in the business school uh, to a course of negotiation. So I, I know for at least during a week what is the spirit of the Columbia University and I feel home uh, now. Well, I'm, I'm going to share with you uh, and I will tell like a story uh, what, uh, what happened in Portugal, the starting point of the energy sector 10 years ago, what uh, was the recent evolution where a uh, lot of uh, measures were taken that are responsible to build a, a, a more sustainable energy sector in Portugal. And I will, I will end with the current situation, as you know, is a situation of, uh, of uh, financial and economic crisis. 
and I look to the future, what are the solutions in terms of energy. So starting uh, by the beginning and starting the story, uh, well, we had in Portugal many waves of uh, develop, development in energy. We, we had oil, uh, hydro and coal uh, during almost all the uh, 20th century. Uh, at the final of the 20th century, we introduced natural gas. Natural gas is a very recent uh, sector in Portugal. And since 2004, we have a big development on renewable energies. But what is the starting point on energy sector? It's, it's characterized by a large energy and financial dependency from abroad. If you see around 30, between 30 and 40 percent of our uh, total deficit in trade balance is due to energy, what, what is very big. And also, it is a mix that is very uh, carbonized. So uh, by 2003, only 16% uh, of uh, our primary, primary energy consumption was non-fossil, so uh, was renewable energy. So this is the starting point, a, a sector very dependent of uh, abroad and very uh, carbonized and uh, very based on fossil resources. As you may know, Portugal doesn't have any fossil resource. Well, we don't have coal, we don't have uh, oil, we don't have natural gas. What we have uh, is uh, uh, natural resources. So that's why is a simple choice that we had. Of course, it is necessary to, to, to put ambitious targets when you have to succeed and to, uh, to, to obtain and to achieve these targets. As you know, at uh, European level, we have the famous 202020 that uh, translates to Portugal in the 31, 20%. So our uh, target in terms of renewable energy is not 20%, but 31% of uh, gross finance, uh, final, uh, final energy consumption. And our, um, and our uh, target in terms of energy efficiency is the uh, 20%. In the 31% of uh, energy, uh, of renewable energy on the final cons consumption, 10% come from, uh, uh, come in the, in the sector of the transport, which is the smallest uh, target we have but perhaps the most difficult to achieve, as we'll see. This target represents, in terms of all the 27 member states of the European Union, the fifth uh, most ambitious target, 31%, uh, that is around 60% in electricity. Of course, this target is split in different types of use. So the 31% represents 60% on electricity, uh, 55 uh, if we discount the, the pumping, 31% uh, in the heating and cooling use, and 10% in the transportation. And gi this, is, this gives you an idea uh, from, uh, about the difficulty of renewable energies uh, progressing uh, in different sectors. So it's easier to do on electricity, um, not so easy and in heating and cooling and very difficult in the transport uh, sector. So uh, our policy, our, uh, our energy policy was based in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Starting by renewable energy, we had a first wave uh, during the decade of uh, 50s and 60s in the last century. This century, we had the, the, the development of onshore wind, and more recently, and for the future, we 
uh, see the potential of uh, solar energy, but about that we'll check later. So starting with wind energy. Wind energy was the renewable energy fast growing technology in Portugal in the last eight years. If you see the figure, in, by 2004 we had around 500 megawatts and now we have m more or less or almost 6,000 megawatts. So we uh, were able to multiply by 10 this, this, uh, this, the installed megawatts in wind power. Of course, the future which will depend on many factors. If, if you ask me how many megawatts you will achieve by 2020, it depends. It depends mainly on the demand because we have to adjust our capacity to the demand and as we'll see later due to the financial and the economic crisis uh, perhaps the our forecasts have to be uh, continuous uh, aligned uh, in terms of uh, wind power uh, allocation uh, in the th this this progression was was based in two main uh, public and international public tenders. We were able to, to implement and to create this capacity, but also to achieve important results. On these two public tenders, it was possible to combine and to put as uh, results of these, these, these tenders, also the discount on the feed-in tariff, and we were able to, to, to achieve a discount of 5% uh, in the feeding tariffs, also the creation of an industrial cluster uh, that was that is responsible now in Portugal for the creation of 3,000 jo uh, 3, jobs, uh, and also uh, 2.3 billion uh, euros of capex. So this this were. Uh, important achievements and important, important results. Also, we were able to create a fund to support innovation. And this fund is nowadays uh, in place, is uh, helping to introduce new technologies and to uh, help uh, some new and flagship demonstration projects in Portugal, like uh, offshore wind, it's, it's a different offshore because it's a floating system, it's not a fixed system like the Danish uh, system, it's a floating system that is more related to the technology of oil platforms. So we have this, we, a demonstration project, we have um, the electric mobility, smart grids and other uh, new uh, energy technologies. So with this with this uh, progress, we, we were able to, uh, to install uh, more than uh, 4,000 megawatts nowadays. We are the sixth country in terms of uh, capacity in the European level and the second one in terms of contribution to electricity uh, in terms of uh, primary energy. Besides, uh, besides uh, wind energy, we were able to develop recently hydropower. Hydropower was, uh, as I told you before, was a sector that was developed in, during the 50s and the 60s. But there were two factors that were very important. First of all, uh, we didn't uh, uh, use all the potential we had. We used around 40% of our potential, so we need to increase the use of our potential. And besides that, as you know, uh, wind is very volatile and you need to have another technology to combine with wind and make some edge e effect. And the right technology is uh, hydropower. So we launched uh, a very big plan to build eight new dams and upgrade uh, six, uh, five more uh, dams. So the development of hydro and wind, they are very balanced and they, they allow us a, a balance 
between the two technologies in terms of uh, in terms of availability of this technology and of the resource during the day and also related to the consumption so how it works during the day with turbine and use the hydro the hydro power to produce electricity at the peak hour because the peak hour is during the day during the night you we uh, we use the wind energy where there is not a lot of consumption to pump back the water to reuse it uh, in the next day. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a system that allows us, uh, the, we are a south country that uh, sometimes have the very big flotation in terms of uh, res uh, hydric resources. So this is uh, a way to, to reuse and to use it. The, the Besides that, there is a technical com complementarity that is very important because if uh, suddenly you don't have wind, the only technology that can be put in place in seconds is hydropower because other centrals will take uh, hours uh, to start up. So this is uh, uh, like a perfect combination, what we called here our, our nuclear solution because it's, is the base of our diagram. The sun. The sun has also a big potential. Uh, if you see the load factor, what means the, the number of hours available in Portugal for all the uh, solar technologies is very big when, com when compared with other countries. But of course, at this moment, we, have, we need to be very caref carefully about the, the costs. The, sun, the solar technology is today very expensive. So that's why we are focused in try to develop some specific projects, demonstration projects in new technologies like uh, uh, concentrated uh, solar uh, photovoltaic and concentrated solar po power, CPV and CSP. And we are concentrated al also in specific programs like microgeneration and mini generation that have also good benefits in terms uh, of uh, a reduction of uh, grid requisites and also losses in the grid. So there are two advantages that we have. And we are promoting uh, also solar thermal to heat water and, uh, and air. The microgeneration program is is a success, successful program in Portugal. In, in the, at the end of 2010, we had uh, 10,000 families that were not only consumers but also producers. At the final of this year, we have 15,000 uh, families. It is a simple a simple process because it's based it's internet based. So all the process to register, to get, and to get the licensing is very easy and very dematerialized. In terms of new technologies uh, and demonstration projects, we are looking at offshore technologies. We have a pilot zone for wave energy and offshore wind energy, that, techno that floating technology and this pilot zone is being infrastructure. But we have some projects on, on, on the sea. You can see Pelamis that was on the sea for several weeks. Now is, is being re readjusted. And you see the, uh, in the, uh, the project that is wind float, the, um, that uh, floating system for, uh, for wind power. In terms of transports, as I, I, I told you before, biodi biodiesel will be responsible for the largest share of renewable energy in transport sec sector by 2020. So the 10% that, uh, uh, that is our uh, target will be achieved by, mainly by biodiesel, a, bit, uh, a little bit of bioethanol, and also with electricity, renewable energy electricity. Uh, this, uh, this policy was based, and if you see the installed capacity, you can see that uh, our, our portfolio is based on hydro and wind shore, wind shore that are, uh, at the moment, the most mature technologies 
those that are m less uh, expensive. And this is very important for the strategy. The strategy, uh, some, there are some critics about this strategy because renewables are, are expensive. But the question is, is like uh, other technology, in the beginning, uh, the costs are high. But uh, in, at a certain point, when you install more capacity, the costs uh, will, be, will reduce. So when, if our world faces in the future an increase of the oil prices, we see that perhaps the in energy, the renewable energy can function like an edge for these, uh, for these uh, like a floor that you have and, and can edge your portfolio. Why? Because uh, the cost of the resources are zero, basically. You have the investment of the infrastructure, but of course the resource is for free. The investment in renewable energy, of course, uh, will help us to reduce CO2 emissions because all the technologies that uh, are uh, based on uh, natural resources have uh, less uh, emissions. The second part of, the, of our policy is the energy efficiency. We have a plan that is a plan composed by uh, measures in four uh, sectors, transport, residential and services, mainly in buildings, industry and government, because the government must give the example in energy efficiency. And we have four uh, key success factors, financing, incentives, taxation, and behaviors. Uh, the implementation of the plan is aligned with the, with the targets. Uh, the target, we have a target to, by to 2015. We achieved more or less 37% in all the uh, sectors. Uh, in, on the energy efficiency, we have, uh, it's important to not, of course, we have to do what, uh, what uh, we have to define and to implement the measures that are able to reduce the consumption, but we have to implement also some projects that uh, uh, allow in the future some uh, structural modifications. And we have two projects. One is the electric vehicle that uh, in terms of energy puts the car, will put the car in the, in the, in the future as a storage uh, capacity for the moment the only way that we have to store energy is in is water in the dams but in the future we can use cars to do this during the day uh, during the night and even or also to sell to the grid during the day so make some storage of energy of course this will help to uh, smooth the diagram uh, of energy that is necessary for an economy. The second, the second uh, project is, uh, or the second area for the future are smart grids. Uh, it's very important because you can provide you a different way to consume uh, energy, uh, a different way for the, tra for the retailers to sell energy and a different way for the operators to, to use and to optimize also the, 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 the grid. We have a project of, uh, in a small city of Evra with uh, 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 50,000 uh, domestic consumers have now um, this, this, uh, this project. So efforts, uh, efforts have been being done in order to, 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 to decrease the energy dependency uh, for the future. And if we can implement all these things, we are able to uh, arrive to 90% uh, decreased from 90%, 80% to 74%. Why? Why so a little decrease after, after a big effort? Because, of course, transports and heating and cooling is our dif dif uh, difficult uh, uh, sectors for renewable energies to progress. 
Besides the, the decreasing of um, dependency, we were able to achieve, or we will be able to achieve, if, if you can implement all these, all these measures, uh, we will be able to achieve some important, uh, important results in the economy in terms of gross value added, in terms of job creation, trade balance, energy dependence, and gas, uh, uh, gas emissions also. So these are important contributions to the, to the economy. But at this moment, as I mentioned before, we are facing uh, an important crisis that makes us think about the future. I think uh, the, the, main, the main characteristics of this, uh, or the main impacts of this crisis on the energy sector is that we are facing a reduction on energy demand and also there is a limited access to finance and uh, to, fi to finance the projects and also an increase of the cost of capital. And this is, uh, if we have uh, less energy demand for the future, we have to calibrate and also uh, to accommodate in, on the capacity that we have to develop. So that's why I finish my presentation with five prior priorities for the short, medium term. First prior priority is to reduce costs of energy, especially in, in electricity. As you know, Portugal, the, the Portuguese government signed a memorandum of understanding in, in, in May, in last May, with the Troika, with EMF, uh, ECB, uh, European Central Bank, and the European Commission, and defined cost reduction as a, an immediate and, in, and a, a main target. This is a, a measure that is in place, uh, that, that is being renegotiated. To finish this measure, we we'll have to until the, the final of this, e this year, but we have also identified some drivers for cost reduction in the future. The renegotiation means that we need to decrease for the short run the costs of feeding tariffs, and perhaps we have to enlarge the, the time for the, these, these tariffs. The second priority is when you face um, not a predictable uh, evolution in the demand, you have to continue monitoring demand and supply. For example, we, we had last year, uh, we had to present to, to the European Commission our plan for renewable energy, and we forecast uh, that, uh, certain evolution in the demand. One year after, we are reviewing these, these uh, downwards, this, uh, this, uh, this scenario. So it's important to, in the, in the, from the side of demand, you have to evaluate the impacts of economic crisis and also verify how you are achieving the results of energy efficiency measures. On the supply side, you need to uh, monitorize the uh, renewable energy increase and also see if you need another technologies to back up renewable energies. The third priority is, is a common priority in Portugal and uh, at the European level is to accelerate the creation of competitive energy markets. For example, if you see uh, in terms of uh, wind energy, uh, our major player, our incumbent player, that is EDP, is no, no longer uh, very significant on this technology. In, in, the, in, in Hydro he is, but he is decreasing his share. But in uh, wind, wind, what, what does this mean? This means that uh, renewable energy, the production through renewable energy sources helped us also to diversify our portfolio in terms of uh, companies. Uh, in terms of uh, trading, uh, in terms of retail, we are, the, the incumbent is also decreasing his share. The free retail market is, uh, is increasing. Uh, we have a plan to phase out the tariffs by 2013. So uh, on this aspect, we are working hard also in the, in the energy markets. The, 
one part very important is not the single Portuguese market, but see what happened around and to look at the market at uh, a regional level. And our regional level is Portugal and Spain, what we called in terms of electricity, the MIVEL. So uh, MIVEL uh, is a market that is a, is a best practice, uh, uh, like the North Pool in, in the north of Europe. Uh, and the Iberian market is being uh, reached. To, to tell you why it's important to integrate markets you see in this slide, uh, in 2007, the, the price gap between Portugal and Spain in electricity was 10 euros per megawatt hour. Because, why? Because the markets were splitted. When, as we, we have now uh, the, couple, the, the, the coupling of the markets, well, we, we, f we work like a single market. By 2011, the differentiation is a small, a small to only 20 euro cents. And why this, this difference? Because uh, in some hours, the, the markets work uh, in a separate way. But uh, uh, it's important to see the Iberian market and the interconnections with the rest of Europe. And here we have a big, big bottleneck. So at this moment, the interconnections between Portugal and Spain are OK. But in, in between Iberia and uh, the rest of Europe, we have only a capacity of 3% of our Iberian mark, uh, market Mivel peak. The fourth priority is to promote oil and gas search in the, territory, in the Portuguese territory. Uh, we didn't have any findings yet, because, uh, but we have good geological conditions to, to, to find. Our oil and gas reserves will be on the deep offshore, and for the moment we are developing to be seismic, and also we have 14 concessions, and uh, we are developing in three main areas, 3D seismic acquisition, uh, that is a phase where the reserves are there. Well, the, the quantity of the reserves, if they are economical and commercially uh, expo exploitable, it will, will, will see in the future. So this is very important for the Portuguese uh, independence. And finally, the priority five is to export uh, our energy solutions uh, developed in Portugal. We develop uh, a know-how. Portugal was like, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, like a living lab for testing, for developing new technologies. And now is the time uh, to export them and to use the energy sector to help our economy. And also, uh, they, they represent, these solutions represent our contribution uh, to a more efficient and sustainable uh, world economy. So thank you, everybody, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Please go ahead, okay? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ion Bogdan Vasi, and I am an assistant professor at CPOM. Um, I I'm curious um, to find out your reaction to uh, China's rise as a, as a global player in the renewable energy industry. What are the, the pros and the cons, the particular challenges to uh, each one of your, your countries, uh, and, and how do you see uh, China's uh, role? Thank you. Well, if I, if I may start out, I mean, China is a global player. Uh, there, there's a huge global player. So whatever they do will have major impact on, on, the, on the global market. And uh, if, you look, if you look at the renewable energy market, uh, the, uh, the impact at the moment 
uh, is not uh, as large as it is in terms of the in, in terms of fossil fuels. Uh, the big problem about China is that they are growing uh, on all fronts, and if, so if you look at their renewable energy, and they have very impressive uh, figures, but uh, it's balanced out balanced by very renewable and uh, sorry very impressive figures as well on, on coal expansion. Um, China, it's, it's really difficult to know whether you should be um, afraid of the development in China or whether you should think this is a wonderful development. Because on the one hand, uh, the development in China will make it, uh, I mean, if, if you look at, the, for instance, the CO2 emissions, whatever is being done in industrialized countries doesn't really matter if the Chinese don't do the same. So, so that's the scary part. On the other hand, if, if China uh, jumps on this and becomes uh, a front runner in renewable energy, uh, and there are some signs that they are doing that in some areas, then the planet will be saved. So, 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 it, but, but, but it, at the moment we're in a phase where it's very difficult to know whether to be scared or to be very optimistic on behalf of the, of the planet. Should I continue? Yeah, um, I, actually I fully agree with you. I think it's a very good sign that, that China is becoming more active in those fields like um, renewables, for example, because China is, is really crucial in, in the fight for climate change. Perhaps um, to, uh, to sketch a bit the situation in Germany, um, we, have, um, we have now strong pressure from uh, particularly from the Chinese solar industry because they have somewhere, somehow have become very competitive and uh, offer very low prices. And this, of course, is, is a bit bad for, um, for our solar companies. They are a bit concerned. But on the other hand, I think this is also good because uh, it gives pressure to lower prices and this will lead to, to um, a more competitive um, solar industry as a whole. And of course, there will be problems for some companies, but it's, uh, that's competition. And um, I think if the world really continues in, in the way we have seen it in the last years, then there will be a big global market for renewables and there's place for Chinese, and, but there's also place for other, uh, for other companies that are, that are good. And um, what we have to do as, as national energy authorities or whatever, um, I think we have to, to, um, to tell our companies that they have to look on R&D. They have simply have to be better and uh, they have to put their money in R&D and um, develop better technology so in order to, to stay competitive. That's it, I think. Well, I agree with my two colleagues. I think uh, uh, China is bringing a pressure to the markets and uh, because uh, when we see so many consumers arriving to the market and uh, asking for having the same uh, type or level of consumption that uh, uh, the European or U US uh, uh, consumers have, it's, it's a pressure. And we are feeling this pressure, uh, for example, on the oil markets uh, with uh, the increasing of the, the, the prices. I think it's it's uh, we, we have to look to uh, and as uh, my previous colleagues mentioned we have to look to the positive effect and 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 <coughs> try to to act very quickly we need to uh, develop our technologies move faster and give uh, solutions uh, for example in renewable energies in energy efficiency because if we see, if, if we look, uh, the consumption is increasing in China, but perhaps it's not increasing in a very efficient way. So, uh, so it's consuming a lot of energy, uh, not in an efficient way. So I think it, it gives us space for the, the, 
the countries and the companies and the economies that uh, develop in the past sustainable solutions uh, to, to be there and to use this opportunity. And of course, uh, the R&D is very important, R&D to, to keep uh, the investment on R&D and, uh, and be uh, in the front line of R&D in this, either in renewables, either in other fossil, CCS and so on, uh, but also in on energy efficiency solutions, I think is 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 is, is very important. Only if uh, I may add, you, we cannot blame China on Monday for producing too much electricity from coal, and uh, blaming China on Tuesday for producing uh, electricity from renewable sources at uh, to 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 lower cost. I mean, we should be used to something. In the next 25 years, 95% of the increase in demand from, for energy and electricity will not be from industrial countries. So it won't be for the US, Europe, Australia, Canada, and, and Japan. It will be for, from other countries. So the industrial world should better get used to a world that is going to change, irrespective of w the fact that we want it to change or, or not. Now the world has changed. And uh, it's China has adopted very sensible policies in the new, in the last two uh, five-year plans. It's a huge progress. China could be commanded. Also, at the same time, we should not blame China for investing too little in, in too much in, in renewable energy. It's still too little, and uh, unfortunately, China still has to do much more than it's uh, as announced in the in the last five-year plan because the challenge is uh, is huge, but also we must recognize that in the last two, five years plan, I mean, the step forward, the, the step forward of the government of China is really very impressive, and China should be commended for, for that. Again, we cannot blame China on Monday and praise it on, on Tuesday. We should have an adult re relationship to the, to the country who's the number one energy consumer in the world. Hi, uh, my name is Jorge Ordonez. I'm an MPA student. Um, the bottom line for the introduction of renewables in many countries is the cost. Uh, not only capital cost, but finally the cost that consumers pay for this type of electricity. Uh, would you be willing to comment on first? At least in Denmark and Germany, it seems that the, like, there is a willingness on the side of consumers to pay a premium. On, on, on electricity from renewables. Uh, also, I would like to know for the three countries, uh, how much do you subsidize uh, consumer prices uh, in order to keep uh, renewables going on? If, if or uh, what's the fiscal burden, let's say, on uh, to keep these initiatives? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm sure my German colleague will talk about the German feed-in tariffs because, because that's sort of the, the big success story uh, of, uh, of Europe, uh, seen from the point of view of getting more renewable. Uh, we've, we've had a, a similar system, uh, though that the, uh, the German system is the, the most uh, sophisticated. Uh, the system we have had is that you can see that the willingness of consumers to, uh, to pay the price of renewables, uh, well, well, actually we haven't asked the, computer, the, the consumers because they, they just, it's being put on their bill. Um, so so every, every consumer pays an extra amount in order to ensure the development of renewable energy. And so when a, when a new uh, wind farm is being planned, this will have the consequence of a certain amount of cents more uh, on, the, on the energy bill of everyone. Uh, so that's the way of insuring it. It's not a tax, but it's, it's something paid by those who consume it in order to ensure that development. So that's a simple, that's a simple way of expressing it. Uh, and that has been a broad agreement in, in our parliament about this is a way to do it instead of doing it through the overall budget. 
and, 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 and the, the details of that in terms of what technologies get what is, is far too complicated for, 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 this, for this right now. I mean, it will also be very boring to listen to. Okay. Yeah, perhaps I, I add on that from the German experience. Well, as I, as I told you, we have, um, we have a feed-in tariff for, um, for renewable electricity in Germany, and this, um, it's a technology-specific feed-in tariff scheme. So that means for each renewable technology, there's a, spe a specific um, feed-in tariff so a specific amount of money a producer gets for each uh, kilowatt hour and um, each person that would like to produce renewable electricity is guaranteed that he can sell it for the fixed price whatever happens so for for example for wind onshore it's I think around seven or eight euro cents and for a solar it's much higher but when there's wind or when there's sun, he can sell it for the fixed price for a long period of time. That's how the German system works. And um, you're right that this, is, this can be costly. Particularly, to be honest, I think um, uh, we've made uh, perhaps one mistake in Germany. And this is we put a lot of money up at, um, into solar. And Germany is, um, has only few sun, and therefore this has been proven to be very, uh, relatively costly for us. Wind works out really good. It's really competitive, not fully, but it's, 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 re it's really low cost. But uh, we paid a lot for solar, although um, Germany is not really an adequate place to do that. It would be much better uh, in countries, yeah, in southern countries. Yeah. And, um, well, um, that actually means that um, our consumers, they pay, I think it's 3.5 cent per kilowatt hour, so euro cent, it's about five uh, US dollar cent per kilowatt hour just for, as a surcharge for renewables. Um, but they are fine with it, there's large support for this. And um, our energy intensive industry um, pays less money and the really energy intensive base, uh, pays basically nothing for it. That's the deal because we said if also the uh, energy intensive industry has to pay for it, they will simply leave the country. I think we're, um, we're relatively sure on that. Um, but, th but as I said, um, there's some contro controversy sometimes, but um, consumers, the private households, they're really happy with it. They're really fond of renewables and um, yeah, that's it, and we're not subsidizing it. It's a, it's a feed-in tariff scheme that's paid by a surcharge, so the consumer pays, but the state has nothing to do with it, so there's no subsidy, generally. Yeah. Well, uh, I will say, uh, I'm saying that um, when you, you launch a new technology, you must, uh, you, mi you must be conscient that you have uh, to give incentives in the beginning. Because unle uh, unless you are not able to put uh, mature technology uh, competing with a technology that is not mature, that is no scale, what the 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 secret is to make a clear pri prioritization and start with those technologies technologies that are more mature, that are less expensive. Uh, so, but in the beginning, you have to support the, this overcost. It's not. Uh, if you see the other sectors, for example, natural gas and, for example, oil sector, and if you see the report of uh, IEA, you have traditional and uh, mature technologies being supported all over the world nowadays. Not only the new technologies. So, uh, so. It's, it's important to, to, to change the future to have uh, this, uh, this support. Of course, for example, for Portugal, the, the, the situation is very clear because, as I mentioned before, we, d we don't have any fossil fuels. So we, we must use this opportunity that uh, for some technologies there was a window uh, of opportunity to invest it and to have uh, some uh, costs that are uh, well are okay for the consumers, but of course you you must uh, avoid uh, some mistakes. For example, invest 
invest in technologies that are not mature. For example, I, 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 I show you before, we have very good conditions for solar energy, but we have less than 150 megawatts. That is nothing. Why? Because at this moment, it's a very expensive uh, technology. Uh, so, and we have to find niches in this, in this technology. Uh, so, uh, we, we used also the feed-in tariff system that, that I think is the most appropriate for investors. Because investors, if, 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 if the promoters want, uh, decide to invest, they, they, have, they need a clear uh, environment, a clear and stable uh, regulatory framework in terms of uh, tariffs. At this moment, uh, the last technology, the, the last um, uh, capacity that we launch is very competitive. For example, Mivel now is working uh, around 60 euros per megawatt hour, so the market is 60 euros, and the, the, the previous public tenders that I mentioned the phase A and B, we launch around 70 euros per megawatt hour, and the phase C, we launch it between 60 and 50 euros per megawatt hour. So the last public tenders are very competitive. Of course, the first part of the, the, the story, the first megawatts that we launch uh, in the beginning in 2002, 3, 4, they are around 90 megawatts. Well, the, perhaps uh, what we need to do now, and that's why I mentioned you that now, uh, due to financial and economic crisis, we have to, to, to put in place some energy measures. We have to decrease the cost of electricity. As, as the, the, we have negotiated these tariffs with the promoters, the private promoters uh, that are quoted on the on the um, on the stock market and so on so we have uh, we have rules <coughs> so what we are now uh, uh, planning to do is to renegotiate or decrease in the short term the tariffs and give some more uh, period of tariffs and try to decrease in the short term that is where we face more difficulties uh, in the in the graph that I showed you, if uh, if we see the the at, uh, upward trend in the energy prices, uh, the the renewable energies will 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 do an an edging effect because they won't uh, go up like for example oil or gas in Europe. So it's a positive effect because it's a part that is fixed for the long run and in an upward uh, trend is uh, good for our portfolio. So we have uh, to deal with a short-term problem that is decreased the immediate cost, but in the future I think it's, it's a good solution and uh, by the way is the only solution that Portugal has at this moment is to bet on our natural resources. If, if I may, just one, one little point on that, which is an, on a global level, uh, subsidies uh, go mostly to fossil fuels. I mean, if you look at the amount of money going to, uh, from subsidies, we're talking about eight to ten times as much going to fossil fuels and, as to, to renewables. And, and, and uh, even the last year, it has increased by 20 to 25 percent. Uh, this is mainly a problem in many developing countries. Uh, in for, for instance, in China, uh, many developing countries are subsidizing uh, gasoline uh, because they say it's necessary for, for social reasons because it has to be cheap to drive. The thing is, however, that this redistribution of wealth is not a very good one because those who benefit most from it are those who don't need to benefit from it. So on a global level, subsidies for fossil fuels is a far bigger problem than is subsidies for renewable energy. Yeah. Oh, I'm Bill Harris in Alamo, Columbia. Comparing your countries with the United States in renewables, uh, we have not done well at all. And, um, you know, just in the terms of the subsidies and the financial incentives and things like that, uh, they haven't worked out too well at all. 
And now the debate in the United States, I mean, why? I mean, I, you know, you're doing well with this. I mean, you're on the road, you know, to renewals and re research and, and the development of these things. Now the argument in the United States is that let's, you know, give up, you know, the, the, develop, the subsidizing Pacific projects and put more energy, you know, and financials into the research and development for a while. And uh, is this the right track for us to take? And why haven't we done well like, like, like you seem to be doing? Um, I have just been participating in um, the uh, biennial uh, meeting of the International Energy Agency's uh, ministerial meeting. And it's true that if you look at the international discussion right now, uh, there's a little less reason to be optimistic than there was a couple of years ago. One of the reasons for that, uh, clearly, is that the development in, in the U.S. at the moment is not too optimistic. Uh, it is like the discussion in the U.S., at least the way that the U.S. is acting internationally, has changed a bit in, 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 in the last couple of years. Um, there's a lot of talk about energy security in the way that we talked about energy security 10 to 15 years ago. So, I mean, we, we would like more to talk about energy security in the context of energy, climate change, and economics. At the same time, the three of them in an integrated manner. Uh, and we feel that at the moment, there's a little too much focus on energy security, the old fashioned way, so to speak. Um, I do believe that the US has the same interest as most other importing countries, uh, which is to, to try to be less dependent on oil in particular, but also in the long run on coal. Because if, if, if the US wants to contribute to, to curbing global warming, uh, coal is not the answer. Coal is the problem. Natural gas is a good transition fuel if it can be done uh, in a way that is not harming the environment. And there are some questions about unconventional gas, which needs to be solved. But, but natural gas, in combination with renewables, is a pretty good partner for <coughs> renewable energy, particularly fluctuating wind. Natural gas is, is, is a good companion. Um, but, but still, there are some questions about unconventional that needs to be looked at. Um, but clearly, the international discussion and the U.S. is a, is a, is a, is a very important uh, stakeholder in that. Uh, at the moment, is a little, uh, is a little, uh, I would say, not as we would like it to be, and we are a bit puzzled about why. At the moment, I mean, you can look at the economic crisis, but the fact of the matter is that part of the economic crisis is that we're paying 110 dollars per each barrel of oil. That's a big problem. That's the, the given economic reality is that this is a problem for us, for all of us, all of those who are depending on oil. And it's a problem for the US too. Yeah, perhaps i add on that. Well, it was, um, I think, one year ago, I, s I had, a, um, um, I had a, a meeting with um, representatives of the southern US states with the energy representatives. And it was really funny because we presented our feed-in tariff system to them. And then afterwards, one American colleague came to me and said, oh, that's, it's really interesting. Uh, that's just one thing. Why do you call it tariff? We could never introduce it like that in, in the US. So he said the name was really a problem to copy it to the U.S. Um, but uh, that's just uh, one, uh, one uh, simple thing. I think I was just um, talking about uh, how our feed-in tariff scheme works. And I told you, well, it's, it's a bit costly. It's cost something. But uh, what you have to see is that, um, um, that we really had success in building up capacity. And that was really good. We were really fast in that. And um, by that way, we were really um, generating a whole industry. At the moment in Germany, um, there are some analysis on that. 300,000 persons are working in the renewable sector, just in the renewable sector. And this is, it's just one detail, but it's one detail in uh, the story why Germany has had relatively 
low unemployment also in times of, of an economic crisis. I think um, um, renewable policy is not really employment policy, you shouldn't confound it, but um, it's not just the cost side. You have to also have to keep in mind um, the, the, the profits of, of, of this kind of, of policy. And uh, when you say you want to focus on, on R&D, I think this is a good idea. That's also uh, what we are always trying to tell our renewables companies, that they should really invest in R&D and get better. Um, but on the other hand, what has really uh, our experience from the German feed-in tariff scheme is that if you want to profit from learning curves, so if you want to put the, uh, would want to get lower costs in the future, you really have to apply it. It doesn't suffice to do some uh, projects or things like that. You really need a large scale in order to get costs down. I think this is um, that's our, that's uh, what what our evidence uh, shows us. And uh, yeah, finally, I, I think you're you're really right in pointing out that. Um, uh, that with renewables you you simply get uh, more independent of the fossil fuels and so many uh, per people in Germany were uh, were saying oh renewables it's so expensive and then we had the high oil prices two or three years ago and and um, and wind was really competitive uh, and um, I think this is our this ca will happen more and more in the future if if uh, demand for energy is growing and the prices are going up. Well, um, I think uh, each uh, each country has uh, to to find this specific uh, mix based uh, on different uh, factors. Uh, first of all, the resources the country has, the public acceptance, and so on. So for me, it's it's dif uh, difficult to to give any advice. But what I can do is to to share with with you. Uh, our experience. I think there were two factors that were very important. The first one is that uh, we see uh, uh, an opportunity on energy for developed economy. So I, I agree with Lars that uh, it's not the old fashion to see, uh, to look at energy like uh, energy security. Well, I think in America you, you like uh, real business. So uh, these new technologies are real business for, for, for people, for promoters, for companies. So the, I think it's an important message that is the, the green business is a, is a very interesting and real business for, for the future. And the second part is that uh, it's very important to define targets, like in a company, like in our life, like in the families. Because, uh, and, and, and I think there, the uh, European Union helped us also, that uh, there was a global definition of targets in, in, on renewables, on energy efficiency, and that helped the countries to fix a minimum. As we see, some countries ha go intending to go further, but uh, for at least there is a minimum. So, if you have a vision, if you believe, if you see real uh, business there, and if you are able to fix targets, you will succeed. And after, besides that, if you call feed-in tariff, feed-in premium, if you avoid the world tariff, if you give tax incentives, you'll find the right way in your economy to, to find the right solution to to develop these, uh, these uh, green uh, technologies. Hi, my name is Jonathan Beard. Uh, as you know, in America, if you were having a panel to a general American audience talking about renewable energy and subsidies for green energy and climate change and global perspectives, there would be uh, a large possibility that a lot of people in the audience would oppose all of those notions. You have presented your uh, summaries of your country's participation in these ventures as if you spoke for a government which simply had these goals and therefore was taking these measures. In any of your cases, in fact, are there 
conservative opposition groups within your country that oppose the fundamental ideas the way that uh, so many conservative Republicans, to put it bluntly, do in the United States? Has there been domestic political opposition to these plans? Should I ask? No, you yeah, okay. Um, uh, actually, what is, uh, I think what is interesting in, in the German example is that, for example, um, our renewable policies, we have really broad support from, from nearly everyone for, for this in Germany. Um, the, there are parts of the industry that are opposing it because they say it's creating uh, costs, but, um, but besides that, it's really um, an idea that is br broadly supported by the society. And I think one reason for it is that anyone can profit of it. So, um, for example, in, in southern Germany, um, the person who own their houses or the, uh, the farmers, they profit from the feed-in tariffs because they, uh, they build solar PV panels on their houses or in their fields or grounds and uh, they produce, the farmers produce biomass and so um, I think um, this is really, was really helpful for the acceptance um, of our renewables policy that, that uh, people got the idea, oh it's some kind of a democratic uh, um, kind of energy generation and everyone can participate and can make a bit of a business in that. and. Um, and, uh, but uh, Germany may be a bit special because uh, for decades um, uh, our environmental ideas are relatively popular in Germany and not uh, perhaps more popular than in others. But what is really interesting is um, you say in, in, in the US if you tell us uh, this, these kind of politics you will receive a position. Um, I've been to Asia recently quite often to many countries and there um, you will see real interest in those issues. Um, I, I mean, look at uh, uh, Korea. They are really streamlining green growth policies throughout all of different policy areas, and that's, that should be really something um, um, all countries should look at. I mean, countries like Taiwan or Korea that are really, um, that are really growing, they they um, have the impression that this is a growing market where they should invest. And I think this is a, a good sign that this will somehow go on also in the future. Uh, okay, no, so no. So thank you very much for uh, all of you for coming. It was a big honor that, that you came on purpose from, from Europe to be here with us. We learned a lot. I think it was a great uh, a great session. Uh, we've seen that uh, behind the, the, the word sustainable electricity systems, there are very different realities. Uh, Denmark, Germany, and Portugal, they share the sustainability goal, but they, are, they, they, they put it in place on a very specific manner, and it's fantastic that a country like Denmark, who had a, a, an energy dependence of 99%, I mean, they could be arguing that they have no energy resources. Now they are a world standard, uh, both in terms of uh, being able to put in place a system, but also in terms of R&D and industrial capacity, because the number one uh, wind power company in the world is from, from, from Denmark. Um, Germany, as usual, there's a tremendous capacity to put in place uh, new policies and uh, unparalleled engineer capacity. And uh, all along from Enercom to Siemens, and you have great companies who are creating jobs and creating uh, a new f future. And even Portugal, who's a country that sometimes does not succeed as well as we would like, was able to make a big transformation in a very short period uh, uh, of time. I would say that without vision and without courage, you don't get anywhere. I mean, I think that uh, by the end of the day, it's pretty relevant whether it's life left or right of the, on the political spectrum. Without vision and without courage, you won't uh, get anywhere. Please believe that because I know that business, okay? Well, thank you very much for all. And, and just to finish, let's celebrate Halloween now.